Hello, I'm Tim Smith, and welcome to another Monuments Monday. What we decided to do here, um, something a little bit different. You know, we get a lot of uh, mail. Uh, and if you'd like to send us an email with a question, you can always get on our Adams County Historical Society website, you know, uh, care of Tim Smith, and ask a question about one of the monuments or, you know, ask us uh, to do a certain monument on the battlefield. But I thought we do rarely visited monuments on the Gettysburg National Military Park. Now, uh, that could include several categories of monuments, but, you know, talking to the other licensed battlefield guides uh, and asking them if they have been to certain locations on the battlefield. And, you know, of course, guides pride themselves in knowing where every monument is located and the name of every monument. I find that this one is pretty obscure. It's one of the more obscure monuments. And I think today's episode, we'll just talk about some stuff in the first day's battlefield uh, that's a little uh, less known or less visited. How about that? But we're at a marker for where the uh, skirmish line of the 54th New York Infantry was positioned on the afternoon of July 1st at the base of Barlow's Knoll along Rock Creek. And here we'll provide a photograph giving an idea of what it looked like in 1898. Uh, and you can see that there were a lot less trees in this area. And of course, the Warren map of the battlefield from 1868, 1869 bears out the fact that this area we're standing at was open at that time. Although there were some woods along the side of what is referred to as Barlow's Knoll up there in front of us. Now, this marker um, uh, is, of course, this unit is part of Von Gilsa's brigade. The marker actually says that a detail of 45 men from this regiment occupied this position on July 1st, 1863. Now that's interesting because if you read articles about the fighting here, um, for instance, in Gettysburg Magazine, uh, the authors of the article may maintain usually that the whole regiment is out here at this position, which according to um, different accounts could be 189 men, or I've seen this, uh, people give the strength as 216. Um, but clearly, they put up a monument and it says 45 men. So it leads you to wonder where the rest of the men of this regiment were if they were back at the top of Barlow's Knoll as part of Leopold von Gilsa's brigade. Um, but uh, the reason that we uh, don't know much about it is we honestly don't have a lot of information from this regiment pertaining to the battle. Um, but they do man mention in uh, New York at Gettysburg, where they dedicated a monument on East Cemetery Hill, that on July 1st, they were positioned uh, between uh, the other units of the skirmish line and that their right rested along Rock Creek at the Harrisburg Road Bridge, which is a short distance off in, uh, behind the camera. Uh, now, that unit, um, Stephen uh, Kovacs was the uh, major of the unit in command, and he was actually a Hungarian in the battle. I, I think I don't have their losses separated from day to day, but um, uh, depending on what source you use, and we'll use Busey and Martin's uh, regimental strengths and losses, they had 189 men and they had 102 casualties, killed, wounded, captured, or missing. So they lost a little bit of over, a little bit over 50% of their men uh, during the fighting. And, um, you know, we described kind of where we were. We're not far from the Harrisburg Road. Rock Creek is not far from us, and we're at the base of Barlow's Knoll. Now, the challenge is for you to find this obscure marker. Another rarely visited monument on the first day's battlefield is the advanced position marker for the 45th New York Infantry. 
Um, on July 1st, 1863, as the 11th Army Corps came out from the town of Gettysburg, they sent a few companies on the skirmish line out towards the Moses McLean barn. Um, and uh, the Red Barn, which is really interesting that it's referred to as the Red Barn, and um, on our early map of the battlefield, there was produced in 1863, the Ditterline map, the, the farm here was owned by Moses McLean at the time of the battle. And like many farms around the battlefield, he did not live at the farm, he owned the farm and a tenant was living here. And Moses McLean, uh, of course, was a very prominent Gettysburg lawyer, a former United States congressman, lived on Baltimore Street. Um, but the 45th New York arrived here on the afternoon of the first day. They pushed forward. Uh, in their account, they actually mentioned that there was a skirmish line along the lane at the base of Oak Hill in front of the barn. What we really know about this unit, or most of what we know about the unit, comes from the speech given during the dedication ceremony of the main uh, monument for the 45th New York uh, back on Howard Avenue. But in the dedication speech, they mention that uh, uh, when O'Neill's Alabama Brigade uh, charged out from the area near Oak Hill and came across to attack the Union position, uh, they were enfiladed by a huge skirmish line by the thrown out by the 11th Army Corps, by uh, Union artillery that was firing into the flank, and by the 90th Pennsylvania that was formed along the Mummersburg Road here that fired directly into them. And this uh, attack uh, was repulsed. And as the attack was repulsed, um, two companies of the 40. 5th New York actually charged out into this area and according to the account got all the way to the McLean barn, captured a bunch of Alabama prisoners from O'Neill's brigade and took them back to the rear. And this marker, uh, you know, even though it's called the advanced position marker, marks the advance to the lane. But, you know, according to their account, um, at least a couple companies of their uh, regiment got all the way to the barn and gathered up um, uh, prisoners. Now, probably one of the more famous human interest stories of the battle comes out of this advanced position marker. And uh, the one and only source from the story comes from New York at Gettysburg, and again, from the uh, uh, talk, the speech given at the dedication of the monument. So I'll just read it, since it's the only source for, of information for this story. A remarkable incident happened, brought to our knowledge as we talked with some of our former prisoners. One of the Confederates named Swartz asked whether his brother, who belonged to our Company B, was among us. This brought out the fact that the interrogator, who amongst the prisoners taken from McLean's Red Barn, and as Company A and B under Captain Corn and Lieutenant Lindemeyer took most of the prisoners at or in the barn, he recognized his brother of Company B, and they embraced right there and then, not having seen each other since they left Germany many years previous. The brother of Company, e, Company B, Corporal Swartz, was killed while his Confederate brother was being marched to the rear as our prisoner. I know a lot of people who spent a lot of time researching this story and trying to develop more, but we have been unable to find the identity of the soldier from Alabama, supposedly named Swartz, who is the brother of the man in the 45th New York. Now, um, the guy in the 45th New York, he was killed in the battle. He is in Company B. His name is Rudolph Swartz. 
but um, there doesn't seem to be a soldier in O'Neill's brigade in one of these units that had been captured that matches uh, what could have been his brother. Of course, maybe he changed his name, uh, maybe he anglicized the name uh, somewhat, but um, uh, uh, it's just, it's one of those mysteries. But having said that, it's again one of the best known human interest stories associated with this part of the battlefield. And in um, 1963, during the 100th anniversary of the battle, they performed different vignettes around uh, the Gettysburg National Military Park. And this is one of the vignettes that they, um, uh, you know, uh, kept. Uh, alive and you could see during your visit to the battlefield at that time. So uh, come out and uh, uh, you can visit this monument along the farm lane to the Moses McLean house. It is, it is still here and again, rarely visited. Now the 19th Indiana might not be one of the lesser visited monuments on the first day's battlefield, but definitely, you know, uh, people park up there, they might uh, talk about the 24th Michigan or see the monument to the 26th North Carolina, um, but, you know, most people just ride by it. I know I do a lot of uh, school groups uh, from Indiana on tour, and I'll stop up there and point to the 19th Indiana. But the monument was dedicated on um, October 28th, uh, 1885. And again, Indiana put up monuments at a time where uh, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association did not require flank markers. So uh, the Indiana monuments around the battlefield do not have flank markers. And this is kind of unfortunate for um, Civil War historians. I, I, I think we forget how easy it is to rely on the flank markers for our knowledge of their position. Like in this case, I would love to know where the 19th Indiana had their left flank during the first day of the battle when they were outflanked by uh, Pettigrew's brigade that attacked on the afternoon of July 1st. Um, and, uh, you know, for the 20th Indiana, we talked about in another earlier video in near uh, between Devil's Den and the wheat field in the Rosewood lot, um, I'm not sure where their right or their left flank may have been uh, during that uh, fighting. And of course, the 24th Michigan um, a monument, they also do not have flank markers, so you, you don't even know where uh, the 19th Indiana and 24th Michigan are suggesting that they connected. And this whole area has been destroyed because of uh, multiple roadbeds through this area anyway. I wanted to mention that a couple things about the monument I find interesting. One is uh, you can't see a mention on the front of the monument that this is the 19th Indiana. It says it's Indiana, but you don't see the 19th. Actually, around the side, it says the 19th Indiana on it. It tells you about the Iron Brigade, and it has uh, uh, quote marks around the Iron Brigade, and one of the quote marks is facing in the wrong direction. I don't know what the issue was with that, if they couldn't, uh, the carver couldn't do the quote marks in the other direction. But uh, it, it's fascinating. And they tell you their um, effective strength during the entire Civil War and their losses. At the Battle of Gettysburg, they had, um, according to, you know, um, uh, Busey and Martin's strength and losses, about uh, 288 men and lost 210 of them for about a 73% loss. So in the afternoon of the first day, they were, um, you know, badly mauled by the attack of the Southern Army uh, and they were driven back. Um, the Lieutenant Colonel of this unit was William W. Dudley and um, he mentions in one of his accounts that he was shot in the leg at the very spot where the monument uh, stands. And also, 
uh, this area around us I wanted to mention has been greatly altered. Um, and we're going to show you an image taken from here in front of the monument, or behind the monument, looking across the monument, out in that direction along Willoughby's Run. When the Gettysburg Springs Hotel was established, they dammed off a part of Willoughby's Run and formed uh, what is referred to as a pond or a lake in Willoughby's Run. And I'm sure you're surprised to see this image because today you go anywhere along there and splash through Willoughby's Run and it, and it really doesn't come up to your, you know, more than your ankles or in very deep places, maybe up to your knees. And they, they formed like a literal lake and they had um, rowboats on this uh, lake in this, um, um, uh, this, you know, Willoughby's run today. Also, of course, is something we are going to talk about here for uh, the end of this video is something on the first day's battlefield that's not necessarily a monument, but something that's not visited very often, but a bunch of people uh, talk about this. And so it's a site associated with it. And we'll go there now. Of course, we're standing at Willoughby's Run, named after Willoughby Winchester, who owned the land where Willoughby's Run joined Marsh Creek a few miles south of here. And you probably already know that I'm pretty adamant about the apostrophe S on Willoughby's Run. Now, this, of course, is the site of the engagement in the early morning action between the Iron Brigade and James Archer's men from Alabama and uh, Tennessee. And during the afternoon action, of course, uh, this is where uh, Pettigrew's Brigade crossed the stream and through the woods and hit the 19th Indiana, the 24th Michigan, the 2nd and 7th Wisconsin. So there was heavy fighting here throughout July 1st. You know, one of the things that um, we don't talk much about in our Monuments Monday is places where um, there were supposedly monuments, but they d never really existed. Um, when I became a tour guide, there was plenty of talk amongst people about a marker that supposedly existed, supposedly existed at one point uh, on the other side of Willoughby's Run to mark the site where James Archer was captured by members of the 2nd Wisconsin. And, you know, I looked into it and um, came to the conclusion uh, there's a, a National Tribune article that references it and uh, it's mentioned in a book on the second Wisconsin that the monument was never actually placed, that people talked about putting up a monument to mark the spot where General James Archer was captured, but never really did. And so you might hear people say they're looking for that. Uh, something that is along Willoughby's Run and can be seen today is the abutment for the bridge over Springs Avenue that led from the town of Gettysburg out to the Springs Hotel. The Springs Hotel was constructed in 1868-1869. It opened for business in July of 1869 and there is a lithograph that was used in John Batchelder's book, Gettysburg, What to See and How to See It, uh, first published in the 1870s, that actually shows the bridge over Willoughby's Run from this angle. Actually, in the lithograph, the artist is a little bit farther back and you can look across Springs Avenue and you can see the bridge. And up in the distance, you can see the Springs Hotel and you can see the horse-drawn trolley that led over the tracks. And you know, the Warren map, which was surveyed in 1868 and 1869, actually shows the horse-drawn trolley uh, railroad that led across Springs Avenue, down through the town of Gettysburg, and out to the railroad station. So, uh, uh, and we're not exactly 
sure how many years the horse-drawn trolley was operational, but for many years you could get off the train station, get onto this trolley, and the horses would pull the trolley cars out here across the bridge and up the tracks to the hotel. Uh, and this is the Springs Hotel, one of the first major commercial enterprises in the Gettysburg area. And uh, I think it was uh, three years ago, uh, the Adams County Historical Society received a donation. And in there was a, uh, a variant of a stereo view of the Springs Hotel that we had not seen before. And in it was a really good uh, glimpse of the actual horse-drawn trolley. And we're going to include it in here. And this is an extreme detail, uh, a blow-up. Uh, from an image that shows it. So if you want to um, see something unusual from not the battlefield, not necessarily a monument, but a vestige of the commercialization that took place on the battlefield immediately after the Civil War, um, this is probably the place to come. I rambled a little bit.